If you would like to open your New Testaments to the book of Romans, chapter 8, we will be doing some reading early in our series of passages in the book of Romans. I want to make reference to a class that we started here a couple of weeks ago on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights here in the auditorium. We've been looking at the grace of God and on purpose really putting great focus on him and his part in our salvation and the great mercy that he has for us and has shown to us and the great love that he has for us. And many of our classes focus in on our part of salvation, but we found it important to focus on the grander picture of how inadequate we are and how much we need God's grace so that we can begin to build confidence in it. However, there always has to be a proper balance. And it becomes very easy to get imbalanced. When we focus on our need to obey, that's important, but you can very easily lose the impact of God's matchless grace. On the other hand, you start talking about God's great grace in your life and all that he does. And before you know it, someone has lost sight of the need to be obedient. And so we're constantly going back into scripture, trying to make sure that we have balanced it well. Let, let me give you a couple of examples in Romans. We've been focusing on Romans chapter eight, verse one. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We know that there also is no perfection. So while you and I are imperfect and we commit sin, we are not condemned in Christ Jesus. And that is amazing, gracious news. The verse before it says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Paul saying, I battle that all the time and I fail a lot. And yet Christ saves me anyway. That is all true. But the balance comes by flipping back a page or two and looking at chapter six, verses one and two, where the Bible says, are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Is that what Paul is saying? It is not. May that never be the case. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So you need both of those, don't you? And they're not easy to match up. There is so much religious division in this world over how much of this thing is God's grace versus how much of it is our obedience and how does it all fit together? Uh, let me give you another example. Go to the end of Romans 8. We recently read verses 37 through 39 which speaks of the love of God overriding sin and saving us. It says in Romans 8 and 37, and all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, heights, depths, any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Kind of sounds like when you're in the love of God, then you're going to heaven. And it doesn't look like there's anything in the world that could ever take that away from you. But flip forward, and you will need this text in a few minutes. Flip forward to Romans 11. In the very same letter, the counterbalance is, in verse 22, just to pick one verse, the counterbalance is, behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell severity, but to you, to you, God's kindness, his love, his overwhelmingly victorious love, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. You see what just happened there? We had some forced balance back into the picture. Like God's love is an overwhelming conqueror, but you can lose it if you lose a passion and respect for it. So we have to kind of look at both sides of those things. And tonight, that's what we're going to be doing, kind of looking at the other side from the grace study that we've been having. And I thought it might be good just to open with this question. Can a Christian fall from grace? And there are no tricks to this question. I'm asking if you are saved, you have found the love of Christ You've been baptized into Christ. All of your sins have been washed away. No trick question here with Christian. Is it possible even in and amongst the grace of God for you to lose the value of his grace and fall away? The answer is yes. And yes and yes. And I'll say yes 10 times if you want me to, but you don't need me to do that. What you have on this slide on the left are 10 
very important balance passages. And I've listed them there for you because I would like for you to make notation of them somewhere. These 10 New Testament passages teach us that it is possible for a child of God to no longer be a child of God, that that risk exists. I hope that you have some willingness to do a little bit of chain reference work in your Bible. If you have a margin of any size, you can do this, pen or pencil. I have intentionally put them in chronological order, biblically speaking, you know, Acts comes first, then Romans and on. What I would encourage you to do is when you get to one of these, after we've studied it, write the next one in the margin. And then when you get to that one in our study, write the next one in the margin. And each one we study tonight, write the one that's next right there beside it. And then when you get to the bottom one, any ideas how to link a chain at the end? Anybody ever taken a chain and went and linked it like that? When you get down to 2 Peter 2, you're going to write Acts 8 in the margin. The good news about that is you can leave here knowing that there are 10 passages that teach that a Christian can fall away and you will only at any point in time have to be able to find one of them, only one of them, and you will have found all 10 of them because you've created your own chain reference. I will not be reading them in that order, however, which is going to mess everything up. Uh, all the white ones, I will, but the two that are yellow are the two examples of people falling away. The, the eight texts that are white are doctrinal teachings concerning it, and the two that are examples I'm saving till the end. So we're in Romans 11, and that's where we will begin. But I really didn't want to take 38 and a half minutes convincing you that a Christian can fall away, because the text is going to make that so obvious that you don't need me to argue that. This is the question I'm really interested in. In. I know we can lose our salvation because the Bible repeatedly tells us such, and you'll see it tonight. I want to know how that happens. That's important to me. Because most important of all is making sure that whatever it takes to lose God's incredible grace, whatever it takes for God to still love me, but no longer bless me, I want to know exactly what that entails so that I can avoid it. So here's what we will be doing. If you're in Romans 11, we're going to read all of the texts that you see there behind me, only one or two extra. I typed up these notes and I printed them in the back. They're pretty rough, but you can leave here with all the same data that I have in front of me as we get into this study. Now, I will try to move swiftly, number one, but also not to commentate too heavily. I can't read one of these verses and then put in a list of things that will cause you to fall away that fit our church or fit my life. I can only tell you what the text says, and I hope that you will love that and respect it. So let's start. Make a list and work our way down it. Let's start in Romans 11. The text here is about how the entire Israelite nation that we mentioned this morning was cut off by God and Gentiles were grafted into the body of Christ. But if they could be cut off... The ones whom he born first, so can you. Let's read it. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them, and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches, the Jewish people were broken off so that I, the Gentiles, might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. We have been grafted in later than the Jews who were taught the gospel. And yet we can be cut away. But in the text, I can't make some list of what would cause you to be cut away. I can only show you what's in the text. So let me start with this. Verse 20. If we stop believing in God, if we stop trusting, do you see the word faith in verse 20? If we stop trusting in what God is doing through Christ, 
we will fall away. It begins with that. Trust and faith. In verse 22, it says you must continue. So there's this sense of effort. When I stop making effort, I stop being pleasing to God. But I want you to know what the effort is. Continue in his kindness. It seems silly. Who would ever say, God, I see this kindness you've prepared. I see all this grace and all this mercy and I see all the kind things that you promised me and I just have to tell you, I don't know if I believe in that anymore and I don't think I want that anymore. That's what he's talking about here. If we get to that point, the grace of God will no longer cover us. Please, in your families with your kids. And I can't do this with all 10 or we will be here till 8 o'clock. Please talk to your children about what they believe, about who they have faith in, and about how much God's kindness, how much it means to them. Because losing that will cost us everything. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, we're just moving forward with this. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. We get a piece of imagery that I think is pretty easy to understand. Do you not know, 1 Corinthians 9 and 24... Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run, Paul writes, in such a way as not without aim. I know where I'm going. And I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Somebody says, nobody who's ever been a Christian can ever fall from grace. And if they did fall from grace, then they never had it to begin with. I'm pretty sure the Apostle Paul lived in the grace of God. And yet he knew that the possibility that even he could be disqualified was present. I would argue that the very fact that he knew that is the reason he never succumbed to that. And I'd like to present that information to you. Just the idea that we're in a race and everybody knows how races work. If you decide to stop racing, you can't win the race. Or if you choose to go some alternate path that has nothing to do with all the little cones they've set out, then you can't win the race. Now, we have to be careful with this text because it sounds like if you sin with your body, verse 27, if you commit an act of immorality, if you make a mistake, then you're lost. We know that's not the case because God told us that that would happen and he still can forgive us and we are saved even as we sin. However... If I ever choose to stop running this race, if I ever decide that I don't want to discipline my body, I want to do with my body what I want to do with my body, and I stop training, and I stop running, I will stop receiving the gracious benefits of the God of heaven. And don't think that it will hurt me more than it will hurt him. It will devastate him. But if I choose to stop working and stop running, then I will lose my salvation. Go to Galatians in chapter 5, please. Galatians 5, a little different here. Galatians 5, verses 1 through, fall, uh, 1 through maybe verse 5 or 6. But this is the text that actually talks about falling from grace. Somebody says, I don't believe you can fall from grace. Well, read this nice and slowly because that's precisely the language. In Galatians 5, a lot of Judaism going on, a lot of circumcision and old law stuff. And it says it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you, that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he's under law, under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. They had it, they lost it. For we through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. 
For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. I like that phrase. We have faith in Jesus. We yearn to follow Jesus and we love Jesus. Here's what I want you to know about Galatians 5. Unlike 1 Corinthians 9, where it's like, stop disciplining your body. This is about where you're putting your faith. Judaizing teachers were coming in and saying, you know, you don't have to follow Jesus to get to heaven. It doesn't have to be his way. It doesn't have to be through his teachings. We've got these other religious teachings, the old law, and we have these other things that we do. And they're just as good as what Christ taught. He said, if you ever replace Jesus and his gospel, chapter one, the true gospel versus the distorted gospel. If you ever replace Christ's taught gospel for any other road to heaven, you will never see heaven. So what we're telling people is not just you need to go out and do the right thing, Kyle, or you're really going to be in trouble. What we're really telling you is you must keep faith, verse five, and hope, verse five, in the message that Jesus has given you. And to me, that means a lot of Bible study and reading the word and loving and learning the word. So Galatians 5 is replacing Jesus way with any other way. Then you lose the benefits of Jesus. Go to Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1, please. Let's begin in verse 18. Colossians 1 verse 18. Love verse 18. Jesus is to be first place in everything. That's the goal for each of us. Look with me in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 18. He is also the, the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. And that's not always the case for all of us, and we're working on that, and it's the direction we're headed, but that's the goal. He is, verse 18, he is ahead of all things, but in verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind and engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Now, before I read the big verse here, the conditional verse, if is the biggest little word in the Bible and it adds conditions. I want you to understand what we just read. Verses 18 through 22, you were dead. You were covered in your own sin. You had no right to live. And then Jesus gave his blood to redeem you and reconcile you and save you anyway. Now he says, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Did you see the word if? He will present you beyond reproach, conditional upon you doing two things. One, continuing in the faith. And two, standing close to the hope that the gospel provided. The word faith here is not works. Faith is what makes works possible. And so what he's saying is very similar to previous passages. You must continue to trust that Jesus is the only reason your life has hope in it. Jesus and his love is the only thing that brings value to your life. And Jesus and the hope he provides is the most important thing that's ever been offered to you. He is first in your life because he was the first one to save you. If we keep that, we're going to heaven. That faith will produce in us the fruit that pleases God and all things will work together for good to the God who blesses us. But if we lose the faith and if we lose our hope, We will lose everything. Go to Hebrews, please. I'll show you three passages here. Hebrews chapter three. Notice this passage as well. We'll begin in verse six, please. Hebrews three and verse six. Christ was faithful, verse six, as a son over his house, whose house we are. We are Christ's house. He built us. If we hold fast our confidence and the boast of 
of our hope firm until the end. Now, then he goes and talks about the, the Jews in the Old Testament. Just as the Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me, they tested me, they saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. And they did not know my ways, and I swore in my, wa my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. Now look at this. Take care, brethren. Learn from that. That there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sins. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance. Verse 6 said confidence. Verse 14 said assurance firm until the end. Now you're going to have to hear me talk about this at the end, and that's just tough because that's the way it's set up. When we talk about people falling away, stop coming to church, stop disciplining, 1 Corinthians, their body, stop doing the right things. We like to point at the symptoms and say, look at that. That's, that's wrong. And they need to stop doing that. Do you know that there's a chance that those people could stop doing all of that and still not be saved again? I want to go through that one more time. Stop coming to church, started using bad language. Maybe they're in an adult fornication relationship and you're like, there you go. I mean, you're going to be lost because if you continue doing those three things, I mean, nobody can go to heaven like that. And so they start coming to church again and they clean up their language and they stop fornication. Now to our site, we go, all right, you're back in again. It's not necessarily true. Those are the symptoms, the cause is a heart that has lost its love for God and isn't flourishing in this assurance of hope. It doesn't feel anything. Can I just tell you, and this is where I get off script and get in trouble. Summer says, never get off script. You probably keep your job. I've almost forgot what I was going to say by saying that, which is probably great. Isn't that great? We don't like to talk about how you feel about God. Nobody cares how you feel about God. Just go out and do godly things. That is a wrong way to teach the gospel. How you feel about God and what's in your heart about Christ is more important than what you do or don't do. There it was. I went too far. You say, no, you got to do the right thing. You got to do the right thing from a heart that loves God. Otherwise, it doesn't matter if you do the right thing or the wrong thing. It's not going to matter. Because remember, from our grace study, you're never going to do enough right things to overcome a heart that doesn't love God. No matter how we were raised or what church we attend. You're going to hear me say this at the end, but a lot of it goes back, Hebrews 3, to the hearts of the people who tested God. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6 doesn't give us the how, how we fall away, but it adds something and it's a part of our list and I wanted you to have notation of it. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4, for in the case of those who have, this person is totally saved, once been enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, been made partakers of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the ages to come. Don't tell me that person's not saved. They're totally saved. And then has fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. I don't have a lot to say about that passage tonight because it doesn't tell you how it happened. And that's what we're here to talk about. Like, how does it happen? But it tells you that you can be totally all in with Christ and something can happen in your heart and something can happen to your hope and something can happen in your life and you can fall away and no one in the world will have the power to restore you again. Because once you have lost your passion for God's great love, there's nothing that can be preached that would ever impress you. It's the most impressive thing the world has ever known. I don't have any commentary there except to say, that's really frightening. 
You talk about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's not making sure I do 99 right things in a row. Working out my salvation with fear and trembling is understanding that this is possible. That's possible. And living in fear that it might ever happen to me or someone that I love. Can I tell you that just carrying that fear with you may be the number one thing you can do to prevent it from ever happening. It's beautiful the way that fear works when it's applied in the right way. Move forward with me to Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews 12. We could have added a little bit in chapter 10, verse 26, about continuing in sin willfully. But I'm going to go to chapter 12 here. Chapter 12 and verse 12. What would cause me to fall away? Therefore, the text says, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. I'm going to pause there just a moment. That text tells us that at times members will get weak. You can become weak and still be in the body of Christ. You can suffer setbacks and still be in the body of Christ. You can need healing for brokenness that's self-inflicted and still be in the body of Christ because Christians will help you and you will listen and we will grow together. But, verse 15, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal later he begged to have it back but it wasn't made available to him and he never was able to restore that lost blessing what does that text teach about how Christians could fall away it doesn't teach that you commit a sin and you're lost or you're weak and you're lost. None of that is taught here. What is taught here is that somewhere along the way, at your root should be hope. At your root should be brotherly love and getting the help that you need and having Christians come to you and help you work through it. But instead, at that root where that should be, there is bitterness. Bitter. I'm angry. Brethren are out to get me. Brethren don't really want to help me. God isn't here for me. When what should be hope and love is replaced with bitterness, not only does it cause trouble, but it's like a grenade. When it goes off, it kills more than just the person who detonated it. It can actually defile other faithful Christians. Bitterness is scary. And where is it found? Anybody know? It's right there in that heart of yours where nobody can see it until it explodes. You want to know if we can fall away? Sure we can fall away, but it won't be through a mistake that we're struggling through. It will be through a heart that has lost the fruit of the spirit. Go to second Peter, please. Second Peter chapter 2, perhaps the best known, if you are able to do this little chain reference, and I know there are a couple in between, and you might could chain those to them and, you know, do like an interlock chain or something, but most people know about 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22, so if you can just find that, and then you're ready to go. Like, all the, all the links will be in place. In 2 Peter 2, verse 20, the text says this, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returning to its own vomit, a sow after washing returns to wallow in the mire. I get asked about this text a lot. What does it mean that it's going to be worse for you if you were a Christian and you fell away than if you were never a Christian at all? Does this mean that in the eternities of damnation, there's a really 
scary, painful place for people who never knew God. And there's a super more terrifying, more painful place for people who did know God and rejected him. The answer is maybe if that helps you go with it. But I think probably it's the fact that he's referencing the holy commandment. What's it going to be like for someone who hears the gospel, like those three promises of Abraham, and they go, wow, God made a people and and God made heaven for me and God sent Jesus. And you're reading these words of hope and you come forward and we baptize you and you start serving God. Like this book's just filled with miracles and promises and expectations and, and, and great marriages and all of it. And somehow along the way, you decide, I don't want this anymore. I don't like the stuff it wants me to do, and I don't like the way that it wants me to do it. And you leave, the, you close the book, you throw the book down, and you just walk away from it. That text teaches that person is now lost. Because you can't be saved without a relationship with God, and God relates to us in the Scripture. But how's it going to be? How's it going to be for people who once loved the word, the way of righteousness, 2 Peter 2, and they served it and they lived for it. And I don't know what happened in your life. Started with the heart, I know that. But you just said, I'm out and I don't want it anymore. And you go live your life and you do whatever you want to do and then you die. And in the judgment, you see Jesus and you're like, here we go, you know. Maybe there'll still be hope. Maybe this was a false taught sermon. Maybe I can be saved. And you start begging Jesus, please save me. And he goes, let's talk about that. And you cringe in the core of your soul because the only way he would have mercy on you is if he didn't use this book to decide it. Because you decided you didn't want this a long time ago. And yet there it is. John 12, 48. I think it's John 12, 48. In the judgment, it will be Jesus and that book. But that's great news because no one's ever going to make you leave this book. That would have to be a choice that you would make. And we're prepared to not make, I hope, that choice. Let me give you a couple thoughts here and then we'll wrap this up. I have to go to 1 John because to me, 1 John 1 is the method by which you would put all of this together. There's a lot of information here and I just gave you some little ideas that are found in each text and I encourage you to study this, study it with your family, talk about it, balance out the grace, study with it. But when I try to just kind of get myself in the right place on what does all that mean, I always find myself in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John 1 speaks of Jesus as the word of life. And in verse five, this is the message we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. He shines that light on me. He illuminates my path. He warms my soul. He saves me. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we decide to walk that way in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. At some point, you take all these verses and you put them together and you say, I've got to keep loving the light of God and pursuing it. You say, but that's not going to work. Because I falter so much, I fail so much, I come so woefully short. Is it okay if I put a little grace back in this thing? The text says, verse 8, if you decide that you have no sin, then you will be lost in your sin. But if you decide to receive the light and follow the Messiah, and when you sin, you admit it to him, I sinned, but I'm still pursuing you because I love you. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that passage. It's my favorite verse that God ever wrote. It's 1 John 1 in verse 9. And if we live like that, 1 John 5 and 13, then you can know that you're going to heaven. And that's how we want to live and that's who we want to be. Okay, a couple of thoughts here and then we'll wrap it up. The the two texts that represent the story. So let's look at, let's work our way backwards. Let's go to 1 Timothy first. We're going to read these and then we're going to wrap up this study. Let me show you two cases in scripture where we actually see real people with real names falling away. And we're going to talk about why that is. What's interesting about the two cases as we end this study tonight is that in this case with Hymenaeus and Alexander, it kind of seems like they were Christians for a while, which is kind of what you would expect. You know, if someone's going to fall away, then they probably were a Christian for a while and they got a bunch of chances and they were in and out and then the wheels started wobbling and then and then they lost it. Well, yeah, that happens. And it happened here. 
The other case in Acts 8 is very different. So let's start here. 1 Timothy 1.18. This commandment I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, Paul writing to Timothy, that you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. This might remind you of the man in 1 Corinthians 5 that would also qualify as someone who had been handed over to Satan. But these two men were travelers with Paul. They were Christians with Paul. They were saved right beside him. But their faith suffered a shipwreck. It broke. It fell apart. And now they find themselves back in the hands of Satan again. I want to finish the lesson by telling you what went wrong with them. But I just for now want you to see that that's what happened. It took some time, but it happened. Now, let me show you Acts 8 and I'll finish it all together. Go to Acts 8. The other story is a man named Simon and it's kind of different. Simon may have been a Christian for a day or a week, maybe a month or something. But this guy is a new convert. You would think, well, new converts can't fall away because they're, they're new, they're babes, they're fresh at this. God's mercy has just got them like triple wrapped up in a little baby burrito bundle. And, and certainly until they've grown, they'll, they'll always be saved. Well, there's some of that is true. But this guy, this guy was saved and like the next day he was lost again. Let's take a look at that. Look at Acts 8. You can go back up to verse nine. There was a man named Simon who was practicing magic in the city. But you'll see in verse eight that Philip came and preached and they believed the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And they were being baptized men and women alike. Even Simon, that that former magician guy, he, he believed, too. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip as he observed signs and great miracles taking place. And he was constantly amazed. Holy Spirit said that guy was saved. Holy Spirit just said he believed he was baptized and he followed Philip. I mean, if that's not saved, I don't know what else you could do to be saved. Now watch this. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, apostles, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they're, they're saved, they've been baptized, but no apostle had passed on spiritual gifts. Then they, the apostles, began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon, new Christian, when Simon saw that the spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles hands, he offered them money saying, give this authority to me as well so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I got to pause a moment. That was dumb. That was short sighted. It was ignorant. It was ridiculous. But he's a new Christian like he doesn't know. He's like, if I pay you, will you give me that? And then I can go lay hands on people or hand out miraculous handkerchiefs. And yet Peter said. May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible, the intentions of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see, verse 23, that you are in the gall of bitterness and what? The bondage of iniquity. This guy's lost again. Saved and lost over one little mistake? That doesn't seem fair. But did you see it? I bet you saw it. I, I heard you see it. It wasn't about the money, was it? It wasn't about a foolish request. Verse 24, Simon brings hope back, just like our first verse in Romans 11 said, hey, they start believing in me again, I'm going to save them again. Romans 11 said, they start believing, I'll save them again. Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me yourselves so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So he repented and, and it seems was saved. And if you're lost, you can always be saved by turning to the Lord. But here's what I want to finish with. I'm going to close everything up. Two stories, super different, different men, different situations. But there were three words that were mentioned that I want you to take home with you this week and pray about and read about and talk to your family about and just be sure about. Two of them are found in 1 Timothy and one of them is found in Acts and here they are. Faith, 
conscience and heart. How could someone be lost when they sin, when God knows that we all sin? If we keep believing and we keep trusting and we keep committing our lives to the Lord, we will be saved even as sin plagues us every step of the journey. But if we stop believing in the power of God and we lose our faith, that shipwreck will be fatal. And you say, well, how do I know how that's going? Well, I've got a study for you that I haven't pulled together yet, but it said in the text that the shipwreck happened because of their faith and their failure to honor their good conscience. You should mark the word conscience in Paul's letters. Pretty interesting. Did you know that God built something inside of you called a conscience, that God put that there, that moral compass, so that as you learn and pray and see God and believe, he'll put something in you that will approve things that are right and that will warn you against things that are wrong. And this is where our works become a part of the puzzle here, not because somebody told you you had to do something or not do something, but because right here in your heart, you start to shape what is right and what is wrong from the word. And when you feel something is right and you decide to defy your heart that is a fatal wound if we decide to live a life that does that you say well what do you mean fatal I can just repent you can repent that's the beauty of it but how many of you know what happens to a conscience when you violate it the first time how does that feel Cullen give me a facial expression you violate your conscience the first time he's like mmm that hurts. How about the second time? That hurts. How about the 23rd time? 50th time? 125th? Eventually, that inner, I love the picture of the conscience of two boxes, bigger box, little box. And every time you do wrong, God builds it where that little box turns on the inside and it hits the sides. But you know what happens eventually? You start rounding off the corners of the inner box. And then it begins spinning. And now I'm sinning willfully, but it's okay because I don't feel bad about it. Why don't you feel bad about it? Because God gave me a conscience and sometime long ago, I decided not to honor it anymore. By the way, anybody have steel toe boots for their workplace? These are steel corners. This is a steel corner on that inner box. That's why I read it every day. Because I don't trust myself and my conscience to stay whole without this to keep it trained. How would I be lost when I stop believing? When I stop honoring the conscience that he put inside of me? And of course, it was the heart. Simon was lost because of his heart. He did not love God and God's people. He loved himself and it manifested itself through trying to buy a gift. It wasn't the buying of the gift. It was the heart that would do that. So spend some time this week looking at your love for God and your love for God's people. And if you find passion there and you find growth there, you'll always find Jesus there. But that's where he's looking first. And by the way, your elders, they can't see that. They only see the manifestations of it. This is about you and the Lord and the things that he knows and sees that you feel and believe. If you're ready to build back the corners of that inner box on conscience, If you're ready to surrender yourself to the saving power of the Lord in belief and you if you have a heart that loves him more than anything in the world and you're ready to show it without any doubt, no matter what's happened up to tonight, no matter where you are or have been, he will save you. Everyone, every time when we respond in faith, do so now as we stand and sing.